All right, so part two of this week, uh, that is week eight lecture video on uh, David Lewis's paradoxes of time travel. So we were just discussing, uh, we were just discussing the first paradox, um, which is essentially a paradox or a contradiction between two senses of time. Uh, so personal time on the one hand, or we might call it subjective time, and external or objective time on the other hand. And so Lewis resolves this by pointing out that there is a, a fundamental and significant difference between personal time and external time. And he characterizes this as similar to the difference between distance along um, train tracks uh, or like a highway, for example, or a road and difference in, in, in distance as um, understood by how a crow flies, as they say it, right? So um, using the train example, so the distance between the first station, if there are stations along the track, and the second station is, let's say, 20 miles as the crow flies. Um, so if, if you didn't rely upon the path of the tracks themselves. Nevertheless, um, this particular train has traveled actually 40 miles in order to reach the second station. And so obviously, common sense tells us there's no contradiction here. So as the crow flies, the difference between station A and station B is 20 miles. But in terms of how the train is actually able to get from station A to station B, 40 miles have been crossed. Um, but we've just distinguished distance along the track from distance as the crow flies. Um, <clears throat> and so we can do the very same thing when it comes to time travel. So let's use the example from Back to the Future traveling to the past. So unlike the relationship between, um, in a, a slide we just looked at a few minutes before, unlike the association or relation between uh, Caesar, so Julius Caesar's subjective or personal time and so-called objective or external time, mapping um, his historical persona, when it comes to Marty McFly, there is an important difference. So um, instead of being a kind of linear streak that tracks the linear streak of historical development and evolution, the temporal parts that make up the identity of Marty McFly within that film is forming a kind of zigzag structure, as you can see, unlike um, in the case of Julius Caesar. So here, Marty McFly is born in 1958. Uh, everything is pretty good so far. His path through life is mapping the path of objective or external time. But here in 1985, Marty enters the DeLorean. He enters the time machine, which whisks him uh, rather quickly. Right? It doesn't take this number of years. It whisks him back to 1955, where he encounters his parents as teenagers. And then he, on the basis of his, or really through his personal time, he is living um, a particular moment alongside the personal time of his parents. And then he re-enters the time machine, goes back to the future, and is uh, in 1985, and then in the sequel, uh, he goes beyond 1985 in the future. So here's how Lewis doesn't, resolve the paragraph or paradox, he actually dissolves it. He shows that it's in fact not paradoxical. And so how does he do that? Well, he demonstrates the argument is invalid because it's grounded in a kind of equivocation or a particular fallacy which relies upon two different senses of the same word um, to achieve its particular conclusion. So in this case, Premise one, if time travel is possible, then personal time, then the personal time separating Tim's departure from Tim's arrival is five minutes. 
Premise two, if time travel is possible, then the external time separating Tim's departure from Tim's arrival is 40 years. Uh, premise three is now invalidated. It is uh, annihilated because it's basically uh, presupposing the truth of the previous two um, the previous two premises in their contradictory connection to each other. Uh, and so because we've gotten rid of three, we can also get rid of the conclusion. So um, there's no paradox. There's simply a fallacious equivocation. But once we clarify the terms at use and that we're relying upon one sense of time in premise one and a relatively different sense of time in premise two, then we can see that there is no paradox. Okay. But then there's another problem. Could you meet your past self? <laughs> um, well, note that it can happen, and this is what he outlines next in the paper. So note that it can happen that five minutes ahead, if we're continuing with this sort of train metaphor, the train passes under a trestle, whereas seven miles ahead, the train goes over a trestle. And this can be one in the very same trestle, right? So you can imagine the train going under a bridge, traveling a few miles, taking a different direction and circling back and going over that bridge. Uh, the train simply looped back around in this case. Similarly, a time traveler might be in the year 1955 twice. So they might even get into a conversation with themselves. <laughs> um, suppose that this character, Tim, that um, David Lewis uses as an example, suppose that Tim gets into a conversation with his younger self and tells him how to build a time machine. Tim learned this information when he was younger from his older time traveling self. The information isn't available. It's not available in any other way. Uh, and then that leaves us with the question, where did that information come from? Seems like we run into a paradox, right? This brings us to the second paradox, the so-called causal loops issue. So the first premise says, if time travel is possible, then there could be causal loops and therefore uncaused information, such as how to build a time machine. There can't be causal loops. Um, therefore, time travel is not possible. Here, what is Lewis going to do? Here, Lewis denies premise two. So he says that there could be closed causal loops. And he insists that at some point, we've all actually, whether we're conscious of it right now or not, we've gotten used to um, some kind of uncaused um, or in other words, unexplained uh, phenomena or stuff that goes on in the world. So think of the conditions that gave rise to the Big Bang. If we understand that the universe began at some determinate moment in time, and we understand that moment to be the Big Bang itself, we can ask, well, what caused the Big Bang? And if something caused the Big Bang, then that means the Big Bang is an effect of it that would have to have occurred after. <laughs> and so in this sense, we're presupposing that time exists before the origination of, origination of the universe, which uh, would, would um, involve the origination of temporality or historicity in itself. Um, yet scientists, you know, we, we imagine that there could be. In fact, uh, a dominant view now, although it's not entirely uncontroversial, is that there was a specific moment in time. And that's explained by something like the Big Bang. Um, or if you're of a more theological bent, uh, the existence of God, right? So if we accept the principle of causality, which says that every existing thing, event, or phenomenon is the effect of some prior cause, and we can extend this causal chain into the distant reaches of the past, we might think it has to terminate somewhere 
and that would be, in this case, God rather than the Big Bang. But similarly, we could ask then, well, what caused God? Where did God come from? And if God did not originate from anything prior, well, then how can we explain the phenomenon of God's being? Uh, well, these are difficulties that Lewis thinks that we have um, long accepted uh, in various ways. And so his strategy here, as I've said, is to undermine the second premise. And that allows us to undermine the paradoxicality uh, of this issue entirely. So he says there could be <clears throat> causal loops in a closed sense. It's just that we don't know how to explain them, right? So far, so good. Well, there's a bigger problem. So the most famous of all the paradoxes that Lewis addresses is the so-called grandfather paradox. So going back to Tim, can, kill, <laughs> can, kill, can Tim kill his grandfather? Well, it seems that he can. So imagine Tim, as Lewis describes the scenario, has this burning hatred for his grandfather, and he wishes he could return to the past prior to his own birth so that he could kill his grandfather. Uh, so he takes steps to do it. Um, perhaps it's his older self who instructed him in, uh, un inexplainably how to construct this time machine. He goes about it, has a time machine, goes back in time. He knows how to fire a weapon. The rifle he's using is perfectly functional. Um, he sets himself up as a sniper on a roof and waits for his grandfather to emerge from a building. Well, it really seems like Tim can kill his grandfather. As Lewis describes it, he has what it takes. Conditions are perfect in every way. The best rifle money could buy. Grandfather is an easy target, only 20 yards away. Tim is as much able to kill grandfather as anyone ever is to kill anybody. To make it easier, he says, suppose a duplicate of Tim, Tom, is another sniper who's lurking uh, at some location down the street for Tim's grandfather's partner. So Tom is not a time traveler, but otherwise he's just like Tim. Easily he could kill uh, Tim's grandfather's partner. But then on the other hand, it looks like Tim could not kill his grandfather. Why? Because grandfather begat his son, so Tim's father, in 1922, and that guy begat Tim in 1949. Relative to these facts, Tim cannot kill grandfather, right? So uh, what would happen? Tim kills his grandfather. He suddenly annihilates the very conditions of possibility for his own existence. What is Lewis's response to this? What I can do relative to one set of facts, I cannot do relative to another more inclusive set. So he says, using this language example, facts about my larynx and nervous system are composable. Uh, so these are facts which work together um, in a systematic way to render possible a series of events with my speaking finish. But don't take me along to Helsinki as your interpreter, he says, because I can't speak Finnish. I can speak Finnish and I can't speak Finnish. Um, so Tim's killing grandfather that day in 1921 is compossible with all the facts of the sorts we would ordinarily count as relevant in saying what someone can do. Relative to these historical facts, Tim can kill grandfather. But his killing grandfather is not compossible with another more inclusive set of facts, including the future the simple fact that grandfather was not killed. Um, and the same would apply for Tim's uh, grandfather's partner for the same reasons, right? So there's nothing really mysterious about um, time travelers here. So the paradox, if time travel is possible, Tim could kill his grandfather. If time travel is possible, then Tim could not kill his grandfather. Contradiction, therefore it's not possible. Well, again, an equivocation is at play here. If time travel is possible, we can fix it. Holding fixed only the facts of the past, then Tim could kill his grandfather. 
But if time travel is possible, then holding fixed only the facts of the present, Tim could not kill his grandfather. Therefore, having clarified the details at issue in each of the two premises, we show that it is not in fact a paradox. Um, so I'm gonna end it there. Hope you guys are having a great week and I look forward to seeing you in our Zoom meeting.